Okay, this video is about ionic equations and solutions. Uh, before we discuss ionic equations, we need to discuss a little bit more clearly the concepts of solutions and how they work and some of the terminology there, uh, because ionic equations are going to mainly apply in situations where we have chemicals that are dissolved, that are in solution, um, so that the ions are uh, se separated from one another or disassociated. So uh, what is a solution? Well, a solution is a, um, it's a mixture of some solvents and some solutes. Okay, these are the, the technical terms. Solvents are the, uh, usually a, some kind of a liquid, uh, in fact, although it doesn't have to be liquid. There are situations where gases and other forms of matter can uh, dissolve things, can be, it can act as the solvent. But the solvent is basically the dissolver, okay? And it's the thing that dissolves the other compounds that are put into it. And this is, in most cases, okay, the most common and universal solvent that we will always be dealing with quite frequently is uh, we have this symbol AQ for aqueous solution. Well, that means water. So water is the universal solvent. It's sometimes called um, it is one of the most common and, and one of the best solvents, actually, that, that exist. But there are other, other types of solvents for other types of compounds, and uh, many ac acids can also act as, as solvents and so on. Um, and then the, the things that are put into the solvent, okay, which are dissolved by it, um, dissolved means literally from the Latin dissolvere, it means it's broken apart, okay? Or like, like if you had two things which are chained or bonded together, the solvent is going to dissolve them, it's going to unbond or un, uh, unbind them from one another. So it, it breaks them apart. So the solutes are the things that are dissolved. They are the things that are broken apart by the solvent in the solution. And how does this happen? Well, in the case of water and uh, many of the acids, it's because they're polar compounds. Um, they have regions of charge which are positive and negative on, on the molecule. So I've kind of drawn this here. This is like a situation where we have put in our, our solute into the water and it's just, it's just been put in there. Nothing has been dissolved yet. Um, so we have lead nitrate here, which is an ionic compound. So it's for, formed of a lead cation with a plus two charge and then two nitrate ions with a minus one charge on each of those. So it's ionic compound, but right now it's, it's not dissolved yet. These nitrates are still associated with the lead. They're still bonded to it by the electrostatic attractions between these, between these particles. And what is going to make for a good solvent with ionic compounds is a polar compound like water because the regions of positive and negative charge on the uh, molecules of the solvent are going to <clears throat> arrange themselves uh, to act on the solute in such a way that um, you get all of the, you know, the positive ends of these water molecules are going to line up to um, associate themselves and to surround this negative charge on the nitrates and the negative ends of the water molecules are going to be attracted to this positive charge on the lead ion, cation. And once that happens, uh, the force from the water, uh, from the polarity of the water, is enough in some cases that it actually can pull these ions apart and dissociate them from one another. And that's the process of dissol dissolving or of solution. It is that it's that moment when the ionic compound breaks into its separate ions and associates with the water molecules more closely than it does with the other ions. And so after the solution occurs or the dissolving occurs, you have a situation more like this where all these waters have now. Um, so you see all the negative ends of these water molecules have sort of surrounded and insulated the the lead ion from the nitrates. And it's pulled the nitrates apart from the lead and from each other. And the negative charge on the nitrates is now surrounded and sort of insulated and isolated by all of these positive charges of the hydrogen ends of the water molecules. 
And so this is what makes a good solvent, okay? A polar substance like water that has positive and negative regions because those can, enough of them, if they align around a, an ion of some kind, they can actually separate that ion. Their force can, their net force can be enough to remove it from its association with the other ions in the compound. And so it breaks them all apart into these little individual ionic units. And, um, you know, if the water evaporates or something, these are going to rebond. The lead is, the lead nitrate is going to go back to being associated the lead with the nitrates just like it was before but as long as the water is present it sort of prevents that from happening or at least prevents it from happening easily uh, so that is how solutions sort of work in general um, there are not only polar solvents but there are also non-polar solvents but we're not going to get into that right now because it's not relevant to the next thing that we're going to discuss which is Ionic equations, okay? And ionic equations are going to come primarily in these situations where we have something uh, in solution, okay, as we showed in the previous, uh, previous page. Ionic equations are just chemical equations which represent all of the individual particles present before and after a reaction. So they write a chemical equation like this one. We have lead nitrate plus potassium chromate yields lead chromate plus potassium nitrate. Okay, this is just a double placement reaction. Um, the ionic form of this is going to represent all of the individual particles rather than just sort of the ionic compounds. And that only is going to be the place, the, excuse me, the case where you have these substances in solution. Okay, so when you see this AQ, for example, or you know for some other reason, like it's um, the compound is being put in acid or something else that will dissolve it, this is what tells you that, in fact, what's going on here in reality is not that the potassium and the chromate are really, truly, completely associated with one another, but because they're in aqueous solution, they're actually associated separately with little individual packets, okay, or groups of water molecules. And so they're actually, in reality, these are split. You have potassium ions in the water and you have chromate ions in the water. You have lead ions in the water and nitrate ions in the water. And they're not, they're not really completely bonded to one another the way that they would normally be. And so the ionic equation is a way of, of writing this out in a way that's actually more representing the reality of what's happening in the solution. So the way that we do that uh, is we, we basically we split these ionic compounds into their separate ions. We know that lead has, uh, in order to combine with nitrate, which has a minus one charge, and there's two of those, I need one lead ion with a plus two oxidation state. So we, ha we break this into its cations, the lead plus two, and the nitrate, the anions, uh, so there's two of them from here. So we write that as a coefficient now. So we have NO3 minus, and there's two of them. And then we'll do the same thing with the potassium chromate. So the potassium is a plus one oxidation state, but there's two of them. So we will write that like this. These have also been dissolved in the water. There's two potassium plus one ions. And again, they're dissolved in the water. The chromate ion is CrO4 minus two. So for every two potassium, there's one of these dissolved in the water. And then afterwards, so after this reaction occurs, which only occurs because of this, all of these being in solution, again, because of the activity series, which we talked about in the last video, the potassium is more active than the lead. So the potassium is going to replace the lead in this, uh, with this nitrate ion. And so you're going to get to potassium nitrate, but it's still in aqueous solution. So we, we still have to write this to give the ionic equation. We still have to write this as two separate ions. So you're going to have the two potassium still plus uh, two nitrates. And then the lead chromate now is a solid. Well, that means it's precipitated out of solution. It is no longer dissolved. The, once the nitrates, once the potassium replaced the lead, 
the lead is going to bond to the chromate and it's not this it's not soluble in water so it's actually going to form a, a ionic solid that's going to drop out of the water as a precipitate and so this because it's not in solution as we see by the the state of matter that's given here s solid this is going to be written not broken apart like this it's going to be written just as it is because that is now the individual particle that is that is left so we get a uh, lead chromate formula unit and it's a precipitate that's going to drop out of the water okay so we've taken the this is the same equation these are uh, this is just the regular form of it and this is the ionic form of the equation where we have taken every situation where there are ions involved and we've broken the compounds apart and written them as separate ions instead of as unique compounds of their own. Okay, so the, the ionic equations can include the ions, obviously. That's why they're called ionic equations. Usually those will be in solution. Um, it can include non-ionic particles like water or oxygen, okay, or something else that's covalent. Um, that might be part of the process of their reaction. And if it, if it includes those kinds of things, or something like this, uh, the lead chromate, which is ionic, but it's not ionized, okay, it's not actually split into its ions, then you write that just as its own complete unit, okay, rather than splitting it apart. And it can include ions that remain unchanged in their so association, okay, which are called spectator ions. And we'll talk more about uh, spectator ions now. So a spectator, again, what's a spectator? Well, if I spectate a sport or something, it means I'm just watching it. I go, I sit down, I'm there, I'm present, I am, uh, but I'm not essential to the action. I'm not essential to the, the results that are going to play out on the field. I'm not part of the, the dynamic process that's going on. I'm just kind of there. And I'm not really changed by uh, the reaction, okay, in this case. Uh, so in this, in this situation, we have uh, some spectator ions involved here, okay? There are some ions that are the same on one side of the equation as on the other, and they haven't actually really um, taken part in the reaction, okay? And in this case... It's the nitrate and the potassium that are the spectator ions because they are unchanged on both sides of the equation. Okay, They didn't combine with anything, like they are ions over here and they're still ions over here. They haven't bonded to anything else, they're just, they're remaining in solution just the way that they were before the reaction occurred. Okay, and so these are the these are the spectator ions in this case. They are not combining with anything else. They are just sort of they're there. They're present. Um, the things that are really combining are the lead and the chromate. The lead ions and the chromate ions are going to come out of solution and actually form this precipitate. Okay, so these are not spectators because they are actually they're changing their association. They are actually bonding to form something new on this side of the equation, the product side, than they were on the reactants side of the equation. Okay, so the, those are what spectator ions are, and that's an example for you. Um, and if I really am interested in only the essential chemistry of what's actually happening in a reaction like this, I can write something called the net ionic equation. Okay, a net just means the sort of the final result. Okay, if I have um, the, the classic illustration of explaining what net is, is like if I have a box of cereal or something and the box with the cereal weighs a certain amount, but I want to subtract the, uh, the weight of the box or the weight of the cereal so that I know the, the net weight of the, of the cereal, let's say, that's in the box, and I'm not really interested in how much the box weighs, I wanna know how much cereal is present, I subtract the weight, of the, uh, the weight of the box from the total weight, and that will give me the net weight of the cereal. Okay, so it's sort of the same sort of idea here. The net ionic equation is what's left when I remove or subtract the spectator ions that are not really what I'm interested in. Okay, I'm not really interested in these because they're not 
actually part of the reaction that's actually changing anything. They're just, they're just there. And so they're not really important to the net ionic equation. So if I remove those from the equation and I give what's left, then I have the net ionic equation. So in this case, that's going to be Pb2 plus plus chromate gives me lead chromate. Okay, and that's the net ionic equation because this is what's actually, in terms of the chemistry, this is what's really changing. Um, the spectator ions are not affecting this. They're just, they're just there. They're sort of floating in solution before and they're still gonna be floating in solution afterwards. Okay, so we have three types of equations now. We have just the general chemical equation. We have the complete ionic equation in the second place. And then we have finally the net ionic equation. And you will use different forms here just depending on what it is that you're really interested in about the reaction. If I'm only interested in what, what is happening in terms of the net process, then I might use the net ionic equation. If I want to clearly see and spell out all of the ions that are in the solution for some reason, then I can use the ionic equation. If I'm just looking at sort of the big picture of the reaction in general, and maybe I'm just, uh, I'm not interested in the ions, but I'm just interested in the amounts or the numbers of elements that are involved or the amount of mass that I would need to make this reaction happen, I could just use the general chemical equation. Okay, so they're all representing the same reaction, but there are different ways of doing it. Let's look at one uh, final example of this. Okay, so here's a general chemical equation. We have hydrochloric acid in aqueous solution, so it's dissolved in water with potassium hydroxide, also dissolved in water. When those react, they will yield uh, HOH, which is again just H2O, it's just water, plus potassium chloride, which is a kind of salt. And uh, we want to write the ionic equation for this. Okay, we see that these are all AQ, AQ, AQ. That means that these are in solution. So I can split this into two separate ions, a, a cation and an anion. Well, the hydrogen is going to be the positive ion here. So I'm going to have H plus. And the chloride is going to be the negative anion. Excuse me, the anion. Chloride, chloride minus one. And then the potassium hydroxide, same thing. It's in aqueous solutions. So that means it is dissolved into its separate ions. So I will have potassium plus one as my cation, and then hydroxide, the hydroxide ion is minus one. And for the products, Okay, now I have to be a little bit careful here because this is not, this is just water. This is not dissolved. This is actually just more of the solvent. So this creates more water, this process. So HOH, or just H2O, is not split into its separate ions. Okay, it is, it is just a covalent compound. Uh, that's an example of what we were talking about um, here. Non-ionic particles can be included in the ionic equation. Okay, but potassium chloride is ionic and it will be dissolved in the water. So we have a potassium cation and chloride anion. Okay, and just like with a regular equation, I sort of want to check and make sure that things are balanced. So I count my hydrogens on this side, one, two, I have two over here, one oxygen, one oxygen, one potassium, one potassium, one chloride. One chloride. Okay, the rules of, of balance still apply, and I still have to be aware of those. Okay, so this is the ionic form of this equation. And now if I want to write it in net ionic form, or the net ionic equation, I need to identify the spectator ions. Okay, which of these are not changing and are still in solution the same way on both sides of the equation? Well, it's the potassium and the chloride. Okay, they are ionized and dissolved here. They are ionized and dissolved here. They didn't combine with anything. 
they didn't do anything chemically speaking, they're just still sitting there floating the way that they were before. So the net ionic equation is going to be everything else that's not spectator ions. So the net ionic equation for this is this hydrogen ion is going to combine with this hydroxide ion and it's going to form water. Okay, and that is the net ionic equation. Okay, so hopefully this will help you to complete the homework. Um, this is sometimes a little bit confusing for students. Uh, let me know if you have questions and we will work through them together.